Hello, I'm David Bowling, and welcome to the third in our series of webinars on a new approach to the evaluation of forensic Y chromosome profiles presented by myself with Nicole Anderson. So there are five talks in the series and the most important thing is that you look at talk one first and after that the other talks can be viewed in any order but talk one presents the basic idea of our new approach and it's based on instead of computing a match probability trying to estimate the number of males in the population with the Y profile matching the alleged contributor. This talk is uh, a little more advanced and it's looking at some specialist uh, situations where there's a notable advantage of this new approach. So in particular, we're looking at situation where you know the profiles of one or more relatives of the uh, alleged uh, source of the DNA. Um, and on the other situation that we consider is a mixture of, of DNA from two males where the uh, the alleged contributor's profile is fully included in the mixture. Uh, here, we just use one population model with a growth of 2% per generation, a total size of 300,000 males in the final generation. So all the results presented here are based on those simulations. Uh, you can see our paper for further details. So some of the concepts are slightly more advanced in this talk than the other talks. Uh, if you miss anything, uh, it's all in the paper, so don't worry too much. We just want to pick out some of the highlights here. So in our first talk, we presented this idea of how many um, males match the observed profile. And one of the results was that for PowerPlex Y23 and y Filer Plus, the 95% point of the distribution of the number of males matching an alleged contributor Q, uh, it was 73. And in the case of Y Profiler Plus, which has a higher mutation rate and therefore fewer matches, it was 41. So that 95% point is something like an upper bound uh, on the number of matching males. And so we imagine presenting some information like that to the court and saying, well, we think there could be up to 40 males in the population uh, matching, uh, and we talked a little bit about that in the, in the first talk here. But what I want to focus on here is what about if you know the profiles of some of the relatives? Does that change things? Well, yes, it does, and in certain cases, quite substantially. So we got an alleged contributor Q. Uh, we know his profile. We're discussing how many individuals match. We want to have something like an upper bound to be, you know, look, look at scenarios that are realistic but favorable to the defense. So that corresponds to an upper bound on the distribution. Um, but what if we know the profile of the father of Q uh, and there's two possibilities basically, either Q's father can match him or not. And we see looking along this row that that makes a dramatic difference if the father doesn't match. Because basically, you know, if Q doesn't match his father, then Q probably matches hardly anyone else, right? Because nearly all the relatedness of Q with other males is through his father. So that 73 that we had originally with no relative information goes dramatically down to nine if we observe that the father doesn't match. If we observe the father does match, it just goes up a bit because that's not very surprising. We expect most males to match their father. Uh, and then there's similar results over here for Y Filer Plus. Now, of course, father is, is probably the most um, dramatic case. Uh, but there are substantial effects for other relatives. If we know the grandfather, there's a similarly strong effect. Um, and as you see going down the list, uncle, brother, cousin, son. <coughs> for father and grandfather, there's always only one such relative. For these others, uncle, brother, cousin, son, there can be more than one. And if there is more than one, we just imagine one of them being drawn at random uh, to observe these effects. Um, the... I think the interesting thing is that this situation, you know, sometimes does arise. I mean, particularly there might be a brother or a cousin of Q who is under suspicion at the same time and both of them are profiled. Uh, and we're not aware of other methods of evaluating wire profile evidence that can take this extra information into account. So we think this is a nice advantage we would like to highlight for our new approach. A uh, similar idea here, this one's a little bit more dense and it might take you a little while to get this plot, but as I said, it's all in the paper. 
but now we're just imagining a number of brothers being profiled. So here we consider zero, one, two, uh, three brothers that are profiled and the, and the and their y, y profile is also available uh, to the investigation, <coughs> as well as the profile of the alleged contributor Q. So the black line is the reference case. So that's the situation that we already talked about in talk one, where we don't have any relative information. So what's going on here is this is a probability distribution for the number of matching males. It continues beyond 20, but we just show you up to 20 here. Uh, because that's the most interesting part of the distribution. Um, and the, so the black line is the same in all the, in all the good plots in this column, and again, the same in all the plots in this column for the two different uh, uh, profiling uh, kits that we're uh, presenting here. Uh, but the different colored lines are different uh, results um, for the number of matching brothers. The rows are the number of brothers that are tested. So there's one brother tested here, two brothers tested here, uh, three brothers tested, I, um, by tested I mean profiled. Um, and then the colors corresponding to the number of these that match. So the most dramatic situation is that if none of Q's brothers match, so that's this red curve here, which you can see is quite different. So again, you know, if you don't match your brother, that has a dramatic impact on the number of other males that are likely to match you because it means there's a mutation between you and your brother, possibly between you and your father, and therefore that can affect your matching probability with other relatives. In fact, this red curve goes off the scale here. Um, we only go up to a probability of 0.2, and all the red curves um, for the first value point in the distribution uh, are off the scale. So we've just written the numbers here. So we've set things up here so such that Q is always considered to match himself. So the smallest value of the distribution is one, and one corresponds to Q's the only person having that profile. None of his relatives match him. And we see various probabilities up around 0.5 here in the case that none of the brothers match, and particularly strongly, if three brothers, none of them match, then you're pretty sure that, that Q doesn't match his father. And so there's a pretty high probability that Q doesn't match anybody. <clears throat> Um, so if there is at least one brother matching, then that changes a lot of things. That suggests that Q matches his father and therefore potentially a lot of other relatives. Um, and uh, so the, we can see the impact with those different colored curves. They don't vary so much, uh, but, uh, and, and, and also if given the number of brothers match, the starting point of the distribution has to change a little bit here because if three brothers match, then we have at least four matches, right? Q matches himself and his three brothers matching. So that's why there's a, a deviation um, at this point. But, um, but otherwise we can see the, the effect on the evidence of these different numbers of brothers matching. And again, we'd just like to highlight that, uh, that it's a not entirely unusual to have some information about the profiles of brothers and uh, it's not easy to take it into account uh, using other methods, but it's pretty natural in our method because it's based on full population simulations. So we just basically condition on the simulations. We do a whole lot of simulations and we save the simulations that, that we're interested in, i.e. when there's a certain number of brothers and when a certain number of brothers match. Uh, because we, in our simulations, we simulate the relatedness and then we simulate the profiles. So talk two uh, in this series gives you information about the software to do the simulations. And, and uh, you know, with a little bit of practice, you can start doing them yourself to answer different questions about the effects of relative profiles. Okay, so now I'm moving on to the second topic in this talk, which is two male mixtures. And we've got quite a surprising result here, and I'm not really presenting any um, definitive conclusion of what to do with this information, but I think it's useful to have it in, the, uh, in terms of reporting evidence to a court because we're, just, we're limited, for example, to the case here where the profile is Q is almost fully or fully represented uh, in the mixture. So we're not considering the case of, of, of dropout or at least not substantial dropout. So we don't care about the particular yields here. So we can, we can represent a single contributor ma match like this. In this top table, here's the profile of Q with just symbols representing alleles at the different loci. And I say, you know, let's say there's 25 of them. That's, uh, it's a typical kind of value these days. 
Um, and then for, for the evidence profile or, or, some, or sometimes crime scene profile or CSP for short, um, in a case of a full match, we observe exactly the same profile. And so most of our talks are looking at this situation and saying, well, how strong is that evidence? And as I've been reporting, our approach is to say, well, how many other people match Q and report that to a court? Now, what about in a two male mixture? So in the typical scenario is something like this. Um, now the evidence profile has two alleles at many loci, not all because uh, it could be that the two contributors have the same allele at some, uh, at some loci. And so here are the, um, here's the profile of Q again. Uh, and if the uh, profile of Q is entirely included in the mixture, i.e. the allele of Q is always observed uh, in the mixture, uh, then clearly Q is uh, a potential contributor. How strong is the evidence in this case? Um, well, conventionally, I think people would have thought that let's say out of the 25 loci, 20 of them show two alleles. Uh, so again, we're looking at the sort of good quality profile scenario here just for this discussion. Um, so the number of pairs of profiles, the number of distinct pairs of profiles that can make up um, the two alleles at the 20 loci is two to the 20 or a million. So as well as the profile of Q and then a complementary profile to make up this mixture, there are about a million other profiles and also a complementary profile making up a pair to make up the mixture. So we might conventionally have thought that the evidence is about a million times weaker because there are a million more possibilities. Uh, and in that case, the situation is kind of uh, hopeless. Uh, the um, uh, I'm just going to get rid of that. Uh, the, um, right, so conventionally we would have thought the evidence was about a million times weaker. So here's our surprising result. Um, we think it's hardly weaker at all uh, on the basis of our simulation results. So when you observe Q in, fully included in a two male mixed profile, it's almost as strong as supporting him to be as a contributor as if we'd observed a single contributor match. Now, I'll give you some numerical uh, support for this on the next slide, but just think that's quite a shocking result. I don't think anybody's ever mentioned that as being a possibility before. Um, and so how could it be true? It seems like a, a mixture is, is, you know, intuitively you think it's much weaker evidence. Well, so here's some intuition. There's a million different profile pairs that could explain the mixture that I showed you on the previous slide, but any particular profile that has not been observed is highly unlikely to exist in the population. So I did discuss that point in my, my previous talk, but let me just emphasize it again, that the number of ways of plucking an allele at every locus and putting it up in, all together to make a 25 locus profile, the number of ways of doing that is massive. It's just an astronomically large number. And therefore it stands to reason that most of those possible profiles actually don't exist anywhere on earth because there's only um, a, you know, several billion males on earth uh, and the potential number of Y profiles is vastly more than that. So any particular random profile you get by pulling out an allele at every, uh, at every locus and putting them together, that profile is almost certain not to exist in the population. And so that's the really fundamental intuition here that there are these million other pairs that could explain the mixture, but if we've never seen them before, um, they probably don't exist. <clears throat> However, for the profile of Q, we know it exists in the population because we've seen it in Q uh, for in his reference profile. Uh, and so it's much more plausible for that pair of individuals uh, of profiles, Q and the complementary profile to make up the mixture. Um, they're much more likely, in fact, than all the other one million uh, po possible profile pairs combined. Now, um, that's if there is no information. Of course, we can do some checks in the database and, and, and naturally, of course, we, we, you know, we would encourage this. So for example, uh, if where the, the prosecution allegation is right that Q is a contributor, then therefore the complementary profile to make up the mixture, it must also exist in the population. And so we might support that by finding it in the database. And so if we do find the complementary profile in the database, that strengthens the case that Q um, is a contributor. But conversely, although uh, all those other million possible pairs are 
kind of a priori unlikely to exist in the population, they might, and, and, and so we should check. Uh, and it's not too hard to check a million profiles uh, and to look at the counts, in, and in particular, the profiles that differ from the profile of Q at just one locus are, of course, the most likely ones to exist. Um, then, um, uh, so, it, you know, it's worth checking whether any of those well, ones, you may as well check all a million, but, but most importantly, the ones that just differ from Q's profile at one locus to see if they exist in your available database, and that would change things. Uh, but, you know, without such information, uh, broadly speaking, uh, a two male good quality mixture is just about as good as a single contributor, uh, single pr uh, contributor match. So here are some numbers to back this up. Um, the, got a little bit technical to try and find something that we can compare for different um, numbers of uh, contributors to the to the uh, mixture. So LR one, two, three, and four correspond to the likelihood ratios when there are one, two, three, or four contributors to the mixture, and <clears throat> We've recommended not reporting a likelihood ratio, but reporting a number of matching or an estimate of the number of matching males. Now, um, that can be expressed in the form of a likelihood ratio. So the number of matching males is something like N on the likelihood ratio, where N is the population size. Um, so it's just useful to do it this way because it makes things easy to compare across different numbers of mixtures. And so that's what we've done in this table here. These are the numbers we showed from the previous slide uh, that the 95% point of the, of the distribution of the number of matching males is 72 for PowerPlex Y23 and 40 for Y Phyla Plus um, for a single contributor Y uh, evidence profile. If we now go to a two contributor mixture, uh, the numbers change, but they, the 95% uh, point of the distribution actually it stays the same. I mean, the distribution changes slightly, uh, but this particular property of the distribution stays the same, and the whole distribution is virtually unchanged here. It just changes by one. So that's a kind of numerical support for the idea that if this number 72 and 40 are your measures of the, of the strength of the evidence, then when it's a two contributor mixture, the numbers are virtually the same, and so it's equally strong. Uh, for three, contributors we see some notable change in the numbers here and when we get up to four the change gets a little bit more important but still it's quite striking that even with a four profile mixture it's not hugely weaker it's not a you know much greater number here than we observed here in the single contributor case and i think most people find that quite shocking um and, and so it's a very interesting observation uh it's difficult to see how we can specifically use that in court and we don't have a particular recommendation on how to do that but I think it should change your thinking about how strong the evidence is and to try and find ways that exploit this insight and do give a kind of fair and comprehensible way of conveying that information to the court. So there are the two points that I wanted to make in today's talk. Uh, just a little summary here that the, so we pointed out two advantages of our new approach based on counting the number of matching males for Y profile evidence. So we can accurately take into account the effect of also observing the profiles of close patrilineal relatives of Q. Um, it, it's uh, very easy to do that with our simulation based approach. We just look at simulations where the condition we're interested in is satisfied and see how frequently they occur in our simulations. Um, and again, we're not aware that other approaches to the evaluation of Y profile evidence are able to take this information into account. Um, and the other uh, insight was that mixtures, when the alleged contributor is fully or nearly fully represented in, uh, in a highly informative profile with lots of low psi, relatively high mutation rate, in that case, the two person mixture is almost exactly the same evidence as a single profile and even three and four con, uh, con, uh, mixtures, person mixtures uh, are almost as strong. And again, I'm not aware that anybody else has come to this insight with traditional approaches to thinking about why profile evidence. So as I promised, there's a reference in Forensic Science International Genetics in 2019. Uh, just a reminder that this is number three in a series of five talks 
so we encourage you to look at the others. I said at the start, you should, should have viewed talk one in order to make sense of this talk, uh, but the others uh, might also be of interest. They deal with different topics, the simulation, software, um, computing match probabilities that, that we recommend in scenarios when the evidence is not so informative, uh, maybe just a small number of loci are observed. Uh, and then we look at the implications for mitochondrial evidence in talk five. So thanks for your attention and I hope you found this talk useful.